50 50 50 episodes 50 50 50 episodes 50 episodes gosh how does that sound that might be the opening (laughs) ladies and gentlemen this is the footy travelers podcast Fellow footy travelers, welcome to the Footy Travelers Podcast, where soccer or football crazed travelers tell their best stories and share their expert advice. My name's Colin Martin, one of your co hosts. My buddy Mike Taroni and I have been traveling the world for the beautiful game for well over a decade now. We've been to a handful of World Cups, plenty of league games, and all six inhabitable continents together, playing tourist and catching the footy in each and every one of them. And whether you've been listening to FTP since the beginning, or you've just discovered us recently, it's great to have you here. If you love the beautiful game, both on and off the pitch, and you like travel to boot, you are in the right place. Mike, we made it. Well, I don't, I mean, I don't know if we made it per se, but we're here. Episode 50. We're here. we're here. Did you ever think we'd be 50 episodes deep into a podcast with five World Cups and all six inhabitable continents under our belt back in 2008, 2009, when we were spitballing our first footy travel trip together? Yes, I did. <laughs> You're clairvoyant. <laughs> you knew all those years ago. Always. Have you been like subtly or subliminally pushing me and goading me along in this direction? throughout those years is that why we're here i'm gonna plead the fifth (laughs) oh he didn't say no all right (laughs) well speaking of footy travel trips together man we have had a busy month so far uh, and it's not over yet we uh we were just in mexico city not too long ago estadio azteca check terminado uh i was out in san diego with kelsey for the nwsl final recently and uh i'm Probably going to say that this episode is going to come out in the middle of a trip down to Austin for the CONCACAF Nations League quarterfinal home leg for the U.S. versus Trinidad and Tobago. So that said, um, yeah, busy, but we're not going to dedicate the whole episode to trip reviews. But I am curious, before we actually dive into some of the content uh, that we're going to roll with today, I I need an update from you, actually. Tell folks uh, about Mexico just a little bit real quick. We had a bit of a footy travel fumble, if you will, with StubHub along the way. I am, uh, I'm not really a big fan of StubHub lately. Did you get your StubHub issues sorted out? And do you have any like general ticket advice for the Azteca as a consequence for people? Yes. Yes and yes. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, this is the beauty of being able to go to two matches while in Mexico City Mm -hmm. because we could kind of test out the waters at a less popular match, get tickets through the official ticket provider, which was with Ticketmaster. And to be clear, uh, you were there a little earlier than I was. And you, so you right. went to um, a different, uh, you know, a weekday game before I got there on the weekend, but carry on. Right. So got there a little earlier. So went to a Cruz Azul match midweek and bought the tickets through Ticketmaster officially and everything went perfectly fine. Okay. So then had researched the best places and ways to get tickets to a La Liga MEK ma- match. Like those Liga, tickets Liga be... BBVA MEK. Oh, yes. Excuse me. Thank um, you. Yeah. Um, I want to give the corporate sponsor their proper, you know, credit. Right, of uh, course. Yeah. And, you know, if they want to give us a corporate sponsor, then, you know, throw a little round to us too. It's fine. <laughs> um. So for the... Club America match, which you were attending with me, yes. uh, I had bought tickets through StubHub because they were cheaper and they were in a better section that I than I had seen on Ticketmaster. So I was like, all right, this shouldn't be a problem. I've rarely ever had problems with StubHub. Mm-hmm. So bought the match tickets the day that the tickets got put to the public. So it wasn't even like I was buying 
fake tickets that sometimes StubHub puts on the secondary market for those people that say they own them. And then the tickets actually go to public and then they give you the real ones. I was buying like authentic ones through a secondary market. I didn't even know that like the first half of what you just said actually happened. But wow, another reason to kind of hate, hate StubHub. So you didn't understand what I mentioned in the first case, but StubHub, because it's a secondary market, it's not the official market. Yeah. Sometimes you can put, you can say that you have tickets in a particular section before you actually tangibly have tickets. Yeah. And, that's and so it's, it's, it's shysty. So I was like, I will only buy through StubHub at the moment when public tickets were available. I see. Good move, so, probably. Right. That was like, I want to confirm that they're real tickets. And in the end, they were real tickets. But the problem that we had was I got an email the day of the match saying that they needed to confirm my email and my name, which they had because they sent me an email (laughs) to have the tickets transferred over to Ticketmaster, which is where they were coming from, Uh. from the original buyer. And so we were standing, getting off of the subway, the metro, one of the many transports that we took to get there. And I still hadn't received the tickets and I'm waiting to hear back from them. So it was probably what, 30, maybe 25 minutes before the match. And I had not gotten the tickets and the lines were crazy outside of Azteca. We're at the stadium and you haven't gotten the tickets, right? Right. I haven't received it. I haven't gotten word in the last like few hours from StubHub. So at that point, I was just like, I don't think these are coming and I don't want to wait anymore because we're going to miss kickoff if we wait any longer. So we had to scalp them. Fortunately, we had found the very first scalper offering four tickets in yeah. a section very close to ours. And the way they all sat, they were all together, which was also kind yeah. of. And they were legit and we got in. But you, did you did you ever get your money back from StuffHub? Like you bought these tickets. Did they ever deliver them? Like So you saw me write my strongly worded email <laughs> to them. I did. I saw <laughs> some choice words. At halftime. And the tickets did come through. Technically, they came through two minutes before kickoff in my email. timing. Right. So I told them that we didn't attend the match because I didn't have the tickets. So we decided not to attend. Yeah, we we didn't attend with those tickets. We attended with other tickets. And I demanded a refund and they gave me a full refund within 12 hours. All right. So all's well that ends well. Apparently you could use Ticketmaster. Yeah, you could use StubHub if maybe if their processes were a little more streamlined or clear or efficient. I don't know. And apparently, you know, showing up to the stadium, trying to scalp some tickets also works too. I mean, the ones we got were legitimate. I think maybe when we looked at the ticket price, they were, what we paid was double what the face value was, but even It was still so, significantly less of what the sub yeah. price was. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And was probably like, like on par for an MLS game here in the States. So yeah, I would say it worked out in our favor, honestly. What about? The only, the only stress was just the craziness in getting into the stadium. Yeah. Yeah. What about the overall experience? Uh, Again, you know, we said you were there for a good week plus several days ahead of me. What would be from a travel perspective? What would be your must do's outside of the Azteca for a game? Well, given the fact that Mexico City is one of the world's largest cities by population and by size, don't think you can do everything. (laughs) That would be my first recommendation. But do try to get out and explore other parts. So We were staying in Roma Norte, which was awesome. Very, very comfortable. Great walking area. Tons of great parks like Chapultepec is like the biggest park. It's got parks within parks and a really cool castle at the top of the hill that has a great view. Is that the one we went to? It is. I I will add, I was impressed or, you know, I really noticed walking deeper into the park towards the center. You lost the city noise. Like it felt like you had left the city. So, I mean, it's that big. You don't hear street noise, cars, horns. Yeah. And it's a loud city. So to be able to drown that out and they had some, you know, several hundred year old trees. So you didn't even feel like you were breathing in the kind of the city is also a little polluted. So, Mm -hmm. no, it is a nice escape. Um, I'm glad you didn't stop at the word breathing. (laughs) It didn't feel like you were breathing. (laughs) It felt like you were floating. Um. It was, it's also a culinary city. So the food is incredible. You know, you got to get not only the really nice high class restaurants, if that's kind of your style, you know, AKA foodie traveler, but street food is also pretty fantastic. I mean, 
I've posted a little bit about just some of the beautiful food that I had, and we can definitely give some recommendations. And I will mention that I was given a lot of recommendations for Mexico City back in Qatar from one of my favorite interviews that I had there right. from Raul and Nina, who lived in Mexico City and recommended going to some of these places. So once again, the footy traveler community coming through with some really great recommendations on places to go and things to do. A couple other just really quick highlights. Teotihuacan, just an hour outside the city. We did a hot air balloon ride. That was fantastic. We did an Airbnb experience going through all the markets Mm -hmm. and all the markets, but three markets with very distinctive categories of uh, what they were selling. And yeah, 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 that seemed genuine too. I mean, we were maybe one group of gringos (laughs) um, Mm -hmm. and maybe I saw like two other gringos. Uh, and the it last didn't seem like one the, of those like touristy trap market experiences. It to, no, it totally is, didn't. Is it my, is my message. Yeah. Very authentic. Happy to show the link for um, Ho and Orson, who were great hosts and oh, yeah. had been given that recommendation by a, uh, a colleague of mine. Lastly, the public transit system's pretty crazy, but it's incredibly cheap. And I think we could have easily, I think we probably saved over my duration being there. Had to have been maybe $500, $600. Versus... In terms of what it could have been if we used Ubers. Oh, wow. Because um, the city's so big, but it, a lot of it is accessible using the metro or the buses. And so long as there's not a construction project happening on the subway between two important right. stations. Yeah, yeah. Read the big bright signs and make sure you understand that there is construction and maybe it will disrupt your your transportation. We had an issue going to the Cruz Azul match. Yeah, once we uh, actually do come back to the whole trip in general and do maybe a whole episode on it, we'll explain that uh, the city is sinking and so is the subway. But anyway, (laughs) uh, as we said at the top of the episode, it is the podcast's 50th episode. And uh, Uh if we throw some some sirens in there in post-production. I figured we would just, I don't know, keep it intimate. You know, me and you, no guests today. Just kind of shoot the shit a little bit as we've already been doing. The parents are gone. <sighs> it's just you and I. <laughs> this However, is our golden anniversary, no? I think 50 I think golden? fifty is gold. Yes, yeah. Diamond and platinum yet to come, maybe. However, we did ask our listeners to join us by submitting their questions for us to dive into a little bit. You know, so let's uh, let's get this party started and introduce some of those questions. What do you say? Yeah, let's do it. This is how we do. Now, some folks submitted questions over Instagram, some emailed us those voice memos, uh, and we even got a few questions from people face-to-face as we've traveled recently. Uh, But our first one comes from the Graham at Lincoln Samuelson, who I believe uh, was a gentleman we met in New Zealand when we were there for Women's World Cup 2023. Shout out to you, Lincoln. Lincoln asks, uh, and this came out, well, Lincoln's question came to us just after it was announced that Saudi Arabia would likely be the host for the 2034 World Cup. And Lincoln asks, why did Saudi Arabia (laughs) win the hosting rights for World Cup 2034 as a non-footballing nation? I think my simple answer is because no one else submitted a bid or proposal. (laughs) Um, That's what they wanted. That's what they want for yeah, you to say as well. I mean, the, the question then is, well, why not? And uh, for those listeners who maybe are not up to speed on the whole, I don't, I'm not going to call it a scandal, maybe just yet, but the whole controversy around the latest awarding of World Cups to different countries. Here's, here, here's the way I say it. Only two confederations were even eligible for hosting World Cup 2034 after FIFA awarded World Cup 2030 hosting rights to Spain, Portugal, and Morocco. So Spain and Portugal coming from UEFA, Morocco coming from the African Federation. And then they also awarded just one game to each of, what was it, Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay from the South American uh, Federation, Conmebol. So those um, two federations that were left and eligible because, I mean, Mike, the confederations have to rotate. The preference is that it that it all conferences get an equal shake. Yeah. So with UEFA, Africa, South America giving or getting 2030 hosting rights. And then in 2026, we already know that CONCACAF, the North American Federation, has hosting rights. That only leaves the Asian Federation and Oceania 
to bid for 2034. Anyway, Oceania. 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 If we all know what I'm talking about, it doesn't really have any viable hosts for a 48 team tournament. I mean, New Zealand did a 32 team tournament yep. with the Women's World Cup. Maybe they could swing that. I just think 48 teams would be way too much for them, to be honest. And then in Asia, which um, Australia is technically part of when it comes to the world of football, they decided not to submit a, a bid. They just said, we're not going to go up against Saudi Arabia. Whether or not that was just a, a choice of their own and they thought it was wise in their own right, or my cynical mind goes to other scenarios, I guess. But nonetheless, uh, speaking of cynical answers, I think FIFA and Saudi Arabia just wanted it in Saudi Arabia. So they kind of rigged the system. Um, as we just described, by awarding it to all of those three, those three confederations, basically, for 2030, 2026 is already taken care of. The only option really left is um, Saudi Arabia. So can I, can I elaborate on what I think my cyn- cynical answer is? We were already talking to the Saudi Arabians while in Qatar when these bidding processes were not really oh, God. happening. I, and yeah. it sort of was already rumored that Saudi Arabia was bidding to host a future World Cup at some point. I think that this little sprinkle of hosting three matches in Common Bowl with Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay was Saudi Arabia just paying them off, being like, hey, we're going to give you these. We're going to pay you. So then they pretty much guaranteed that there was no influence or interference for them to get 34. Another thing too, actually, that and what kind of conveniently works out for this whole situation, whether it's cynical or just genuine, whatever, it is the 100th anniversary of the World Cup in 2030. And originally, South America, uh, with Uruguay as the original host for the World Cup, you know, really wanted the World Cup uh, in 2030. And you know, FIFA is now saying, "Oh, well, we're giving you these games at least, these three games, so we can celebrate and start it off where it all started." But then we're going to move everything else to Spain, Portugal, and Morocco. And I don't know. Yeah, again, I think they're kind of using that as um, an excuse, really. And anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, the one thing I did want to mention, though, in the, in the spirit of being fair where we can, <laughs> where we can, I'll push back a little bit on the classification of Saudi Arabia as a non-footballing nation. They definitely don't have the rich history when you compare them to other countries. But again, to be fair, they have had a federation in place since the 50s. You know, they've had a proper national league since I think the mid 70s, and it's been the, their consistent league since then. So, kind of a better history than the US even. And their national team has placed in some pretty big tournaments, whether they're regional or continental or international, since 1970. I would actually say they're arguably more of a footballing nation than Qatar and maybe even South Africa if we look back at modern World Cup hosts. Agreed. Saudi Arabia was actually the runner up in the first iteration of the tournament that eventually became the Confederations Cup, which took place in 92. That tournament was hosted in Saudi Arabia. It started in Saudi Arabia. So I don't know if there's anything to be said about that. Uh, they wound up losing to Argentina in the final, I think. I guess they got the revenge in 2022. But it still doesn't really mean, you know, that it's a good decision, I think. Good point. Saudi Arabia definitely has been buying their way into the modern era, in my opinion. You know, and I think 2034 is probably part of that. It's not hard to assume or even just like interpret that that's what they're doing, that they're buying their way in because, I mean, you have their leader, you know, MBS. I think he did an interview in the recent past with some Western media. It might have even been like Fox News. And I'll quote here, I think he said, if sports washing is going to increase my GDP by way of 1%, then I will continue doing sport washing. I don't care. 1% growth of GDP from sport, and I'm aiming for another 1.5%. Call it whatever you want. We're going to get that 1.5%. So yeah, I mean, what did those Saudi guys uh, that we met? At World Cup 2022, that I think you mentioned, Mike, say about MBS. They had a little quote or slogan for him. Big vision, no religion. No, that's right. Yes. Big vision, no religion. Anyway, Lincoln, I hope that kind of answers your question a little bit. At least it offers our perspective on the whole situation. It's, you know, Saudi Arabia buying their way into, uh, into sports and just continuing on the great tradition of sports washing. A lot of people might hate me saying that, but it's the way I feel about it. Next question, actually, uh, 
brings a bit of optimism to the whole situation. Also from Instagram, at the Badger Hopper asks, what foods are you fellows most excited to try at 2034 in Saudi Arabia? Mike, do you want to take this first or do you want me to jump in? Um, I can take a couple here. I've got some broad foods that I would like to try. Obviously, we try to eat as locally as possible. Um, that region of food I really like. I know that they have various names for different types of things. So I may call it more of the global name and maybe I'll learn a little bit more about what their names are. So for instance, falafel is very big there. And I think that would be one of my top picks for something I'd want to try. They're also a very big tea drinking nation. So obviously I'm a tea drinker. I would love to try some of their tea and uh, I love a good shawarma. It is quite a global dish, but you know, they, they specialize with, you know, various flavors and stuff I would imagine. So that would be, those would be kind of my three. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, um, you know, you mentioned tea. I'm definitely down to get into some Arabic coffee. I think that would be quite a great way to start each day. Specifically, I think I read somewhere that they have a particular type of coffee called Gawa or Gawa. You know, I haven't been there yet. Not sure the pronunciation, um, but it's mixed with spices like cloves and cardamom. So I think giving that giving it that rich, spicy flavor uh, would be a good thing for me to get into. When we went to Qatar, I remember being recommended uh, another particular breakfast dish. Uh, fool, it's pronounced. I think it's spelled F-U-L. But fool is like this fava bean stew that people have for breakfast over there, I'm told. Anyway, we went to Qatar, never tried it while we were there. I think Saudi Arabia would be a good opportunity for uh, for me to get into that. Uh, yeah, shawarma, you mentioned that. We had tons of that in Qatar. I could survive on that alone, to be honest. I think they also have something akin to like the samosa. I think they might call it sambusak, something like yeah. that. Um, you know, quick probably fried, but handheld pies, uh, essentially. It's the way I interpret samosas as like the Middle Eastern version of pies for footy. Uh, that's an absolute staple. So probably get into that as well. So, all right. Um, our next question is uh, an audio question coming from Don Armando, a fellow footy traveler that we met at Qatar at the World Cup, fellow American outlaw. Shout out to you, Don. Don asks, Hey guys, Don and Danny here from West Palm Beach. Hi. Congrats on the 50. You guys rock. All right, what do you guys think about implementing the challenge rules similar to American football, putting that into the uh, soccer game, taking the VAR out of it, keeping it organic until challenged? I, I actually really like that idea. I think incorporating a little bit more strategy to it where it removes the sense of really the element of organic gameplay and, and, and the speed at which the game happens. I, I don't love the way that the NFL really replays like everything anyway, but officially when it comes to a debate on a particular play, they really do only have a limited number of opportunities to do that with the red flag. I hope some coaches, if they do incorporate this, some coaches start to take on the Belichick move where he keeps it in his sock and then throws it very angrily of the refs. But I mean, something's got to change. Something's got to change with VAR. I think it's I mean, we've just seen even recently several games being, I think there was nine VAR reviews for one of the matches last week. Was it Chelsea Tottenham? And Chelsea Tottenham had nine. That comes I, to mind for me. Yeah. It was just an absolute mess. It was just like unlike anything I've ever seen. And there was four goals disallowed due to VAR. I mean, it's just, I, I get that we're trying to get more precise, but you can't really celebrate a goal anymore. You can't feel like there's really any element of organic substance and it's just it feels it feels like it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing which is getting very specific on things that i just i i don't know it's making us go down a, a path that i don't really love and it's honestly one of the reasons i don't like the nfl i just don't like it so yeah i um i i like the idea in general i will say i think on on the whole i like this idea for me it puts the the control of stuff like that into the hands of the team you know sure right. maybe that foul what you know was maybe card worthy but i, I don't want to kind of waste the time and the, and the flow and the momentum that we have right now because we're you know i i feel like we're going to get a goal soon let's not stop the game go to var or have var stop the game and review that the team you know even the players like and i, I don't know i'm not a big nfl guy but i feel like 
sometimes when there's infractions on the field and you can see the coaching staff discussing whether or not to throw the flag, a player or two involved in the play on their team might come up and say, Hey, like I, I actually, you know, I did drop the ball. Like don't waste the challenge. We're going to need the timeout later. Right. And so I think there's it self governs. It, maybe it'll encourage, yeah, it'll encourage maybe some more some more honesty. It'll self-govern itself a little bit. The pendulum has definitely swung and I think it's swung too far. Oh yeah. And I think we could uh, afford to swing it back a little bit and try some, some different ideas. And I think this actually isn't a terrible one. I don't know how you'd incorporate it because I mean, there's so much stoppage in American football. So like you have the opportunity to throw a flag onto the field, but like throwing a flag onto the field during the flow of a soccer game that doesn't really stop um, could be and like, how long do you get? Because right. like in football, you only get until the next play is snapped. Exactly. Where yeah. you, do you get like a minute after? And you don't have timeouts in, in soccer. Um, so it's not like you throw the flag right. and then they go and review the play. And, oh, you were wrong. We were right. We're going to charge you a timeout. The specifics of it obviously would have to be worked out. But in the spirit of taking some of the control of the game, the, the control of the flow of the game away from VAR, um, encouraging maybe some of that self-regulation amongst the teams and the players and the managers. Uh, I, I like the idea on a cursory view. So Don, great question. Love where your head's at. And yeah, I think we <laughs> we wouldn't mind going back to some of the more old organic uh, human aspects of the game. Our next question is uh, from Ben Sturtz. Mike, I think you know this guy. <laughs> I know him. Uh, he's one of our <laughs> listeners who also sent in his question on voice memo. So, uh, here is Ben. My question would be, is it ever more fun to sit rather than stand during a match that you attend? I'd say sure. Uh, you know, I think it kind of depends on the match itself and where your seats are. You know, if, uh, if you're in a supporter section, it's going to be fun to stand. If you're not standing, you're not going to see much of the game if you're sitting, uh, cause everyone else is standing and cheering and jumping around. But then, you know, there's some games uh, where you're at, I don't know, you're at midfield uh, or you're in a nosebleed section and sitting just makes more sense. You're not in a crowd that's standing and and kind of getting rowdy. And with that bird's eye view, you can kind of see more of the game anyway. And you might just want to be kind of still and and take it in that way. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's the crowd, even if you're not in a supporter section, it's the crowd around you that kind of dictates whether or not you're sitting or standing. I actually remember going to... I think it was a game at the link as we called it in philadelphia lincoln financial field it's where the eagles play speaking of nfl stuff but usa was playing a friendly against mexico back in 2011 it was the yeah it was the last usa game i was gonna see in philadelphia before moving to denver so i was stoked for it you know i you know i love my u.s soccer i love cheering them on um having come back from the world cup in 2010 in south africa i was kind of still riding that high and my seats weren't in any sort of supporter section, but uh, once that whistle blew, I was standing up, I was cheering, I was clapping my hands, you know, shouting go USA. And I heard it from everyone behind me. Sit down. We want to see the game. Get down. And if you know Philly and you know Philly fans, they're you don't really want incredibly wanna... gracious. They're, they're super polite. Um, they like, you know, they just come up to you, tap you lightly on the shoulder. They hey, would, it would be really great. They would never get violent. This. I mean, yeah. never. So I was like, all right, well, I'm, I'm definitely not standing for this one. So I sat and, um, in that instance, it was, not, it was not as fun to be sitting cause I wanted to stand, but yeah, I think it depends on the game, depends on where your tickets are, but I, I have had fun sitting down. I will. <laughs> That's important that you've had fun sitting had down fun. in some parts of your life. <laughs> I would say that would pile onto that. I, I completely agree. I think the big difference is it's expectation. If you go to a match and you're like, I'm going to have a comfortable, you know, peaceful type of match, maybe you're taking your kid or something Mm. and you're like, I want to go and enjoy a a soccer match and not get rowdy, not have to require standing the whole time. I didn't buy GA tickets to a concert kind of thing. I don't want to have to stand that expectation should be made. You should be made aware of that expectation early on, You you know, the advancements of ticket buying options now where some of these ticket vendors will show you what your view is yeah. at the seat. And some of them, they show you both the view and this section typically is standing or something like that. I think that would would be a much better experience because you know going into it, what I really liked about some of these modern stadiums, 
uh, specifically like Exploria in Orlando. Mm -hmm. And I think Q2 had this as well in the what we would classify as being the common supporter section seats, which are behind the goal typically or around that area. Mm -hmm. They didn't have seats. They had the standing areas with the um, the bars kind of that would allow you to to lean on like to lean on yeah. and put a drink on and stuff. You're in a section that is going to stand. There is no sitting here. And that is the expectation. <laughs> and right. so to me, I think to your answer, sometimes I like to sit and watch the match from a higher perch and just chill out. And sometimes I want to like get amongst it and cheer and, and that's fine too it's just like you got to know going into it what to expect because you could be very woefully disappointed yeah life is all about expectations exactly good question mi hermano um questions about seating and standing and cheering in stadiums is probably a good uh leading question for our next one which comes from uh Char from los angeles uh, whom we met down in mexico city and actually who joined us at the Estadio Azteca for the Club America game. Hi, I'm Shar from Los Angeles, and I wanted to know what have been your favorite stadiums that you've gone to and what's left that you want to go to? Love this question. I feel like we've gotten this question occasionally just sort of from other folks, and and I like that we've got it formalized here. So I know that we kind of talked about this in person when, when she asked it, but I, I've gotten some time to think through this answer a little bit more. So domestically, I would say my favorite two stadiums in the U.S. that I've been to, Q2 Stadium, which I just mentioned, in Austin for Austin FC. Awesome experience. Loved it. Definitely part of the new age of modern soccer stadiums. And then maybe an ode to an older stadium in Providence Park in Portland. An amazing place to watch soccer. Super loud, great atmosphere, very much so two ends of the spectrum when it comes to domestic soccer pitches, but very, very good experiences internationally. And this is how I'm categorizing my favorite stadiums. I like it. Internationally, like it. Stanford Bridge, which just holds uh, more of a bias to me just because that's the club I've loved for so long. It did have a very good viewing perspective from really any seat you're sitting pretty close to the pitch no matter where you're sitting in that in that stadium. So that was really great. Um, Moses Madiba Stadium in Durban, South Africa, was awesome. It was more of a modern stadium. I really just thought it was beautiful, pretty close to the water. We had a great night there just in general, like sunset kind of piercing through the stadium's sort of exterior exoskeleton. It was just very beautiful stadium. Then lastly, as much as it pains me to say this, given I know the toll it costs to build this stadium, Lucille Stadium in Qatar was absolutely a behemoth. It had a really just massive atmosphere. Like we were sitting pretty low to the, to the pitch and you'd look up and it felt like the nosebleeds were a mile away. Like it just had that gargantuan, like overpowering presence. Yeah, if I, I know you still have to get to your you know ones that are left to go that you want to, but I, I will just reiterate your point about the intimidation factor, I'll call it, of Lucille. It, you, again, you looked up and you know the people sitting up in the nosebleeds were just like little ants. What is this? A center for ants? I don't know. I, I've been to big stadiums before too, and I just I, I didn't get the same sense in those other big stadiums that I got there. It just, it was a little surreal, just the size of it, but yeah. Carry on. And in just the last point with that stadium, the, the exterior of it is this just like golden shimmering bowl, like right? bowl. Right. And it had this like in an evening, it kind of glimmered off of the lights of the stadium. But in the daytime, the sun hit it and it just like shined like this, like not even like a spaceship. It just looked like this massive golden bowl. Like and that was what their intentions were. And it just it, it was wild. It was a really cool stadium to be at my wish list, which is quite long and I'll go through it quickly. Should be probably pretty obvious, but Maracana and Rio de Janeiro, we sat outside that stadium for a long time. We've seen the ex the, the exterior of it, but we have not seen a match inside it. Beautiful from the outside. Right. <laughs> Trying to find any ticket we could get. Not paying $800, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Can't do that. We'll we'll get there. La Bombonera, of course, I know that this is on uh, your list as well. We've talked about this many times and we've had fellow friends that have recently gone there and it mm -hmm. just looks like the craziest, most intense soccer experience you could probably imagine. It just looks like a good time. 
Yeah, it really does. You got it. Yeah, um, that's where you don't go in with the expectation that you're going to sit. There's mm. a, a full blown standing requirement at Bombonera for its historical presence. Wembley, I just would like to see it. I know it's new Wembley. It's built on top of the old Wembley, but like I haven't been there. It's pretty historic. Some people, some people say it's the most famous uh, football stadium in the world. So, eh, um, the English will say yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Camp New, obviously, would love to get there. Couldn't get there when I was in Barcelona. Bro, bro, uh, bro, you're doing it again. It's Spotify Camp New. Like <laughs> they paid a lot of money right. for that. Yes, and I, you know, I do like Spotify. So Spotify Camp New. I would like to go to a match at Allianz Arena in Munich purely because that was the setting for Chelsea's 2012 Champions League final win against Bayern Munich. uh, Bayern Munich, and it's supposed to be a beautiful stadium. Old Trafford, the Theater of Dreams. As much as I can't stand United, it would be really cool to see a match there. And then, lastly, which I think we very much so need to make sure we get to, is the race course at Wrexham. Oh yes. I'm actually reading a book right now, Tinseltown by Ian Herbert. Shout out Ian oh, Herbert yeah. um, on Wrexham and the, the Hollywood takeover. But yeah, anything particular about what, like why the race course? Is it because of all that? Or I like that it's got a ton of history. It's the oldest international football stadium in the world. Uh, they are doing a bunch of renovation. And so I kind of like that I've been following its story with the show and and obviously just being able to go to a Wrexham match, given all of what's been going on in their club's history the last few years with the new ownership and stuff. I just think it would be really cool and like get a drink at the bar that's attached to the stadium. That's the, tur- you know, the turf, I want to say it's called the turf. Yeah, I Maybe. think that's right. So that, that was a long list. But, you know, that's hey, the point of wish lists. There's a lot of places to go for footy around the world. Man, I would agree with you on a lot of those, actually. Um, I think I have Providence Park in my list, Lucille yeah. as well. As far it's as we went s- together, that's why. This is true. Yeah. That, that's <laughs> shared, those shared memories. St. <laughs> James Park, I will say, Shar, is one of my favorite stadiums that I've been to. I was super young. And anyone that knows Newcastle United, just how proud they are. St. James Park is a, a cauldron of noise at its best. It's, it's, on the bigger side, um, you can, you know. What is it at its worst? <laughs> still a cauldron of noise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a very particular memory from there, but that hits the list for me. You know, the recent trip to Azteca, uh, definitely one of the favorite stadiums I've been to, probably because it's been on the list so long and there's that sense of accomplishment. But the stadium itself, again, another massive one, completely made history. out of concrete. Yeah. A lot of history in itself. But I liked, there was something about, like the fences. So we sat near one of the fences that they have separating sections. And we've heard so many stories from other footy travelers about going to USA games versus Mexico at the Azteca and, you know, having the fence there to separate maybe USA fans from, from Mexico fans. Uh, But the fences are short and there may or may not be some aerial projectiles uh, that make it over the fence um, every (laughs) now and then. And yeah, just kind of seeing that was kind of cool. It was kind of fun, like putting ourselves into the story of a lot of right. our colleagues who have told us those stories of like Mexican fans throwing things over those fences. Yeah, and like, oh, you know, maybe we, that's where this happened. Let's just say it. You know, we've said things ambiguously twice already, like bags of excrement and urine. <laughs> from what we've heard, from what we've heard. Um, thankfully, we did not have that experience. Anyway, uh, another one would be Leighton Orient Stadium for me. People may not know Leighton Orient down in the lower levels of, of English football. I think I was, I don't know, 14-ish, maybe 12 even, uh, but played a tournament over in London one summer. And uh, there was a preseason friendly between Leighton Orient and West Ham, I want to say. Our coaches and chaperones took us to that. It was one of my first memories of having meat pies at halftime. So that, I don't know. There's just like, my, Mike knows how into food I am and always making sure I'm not hungry. Just, you know, a meat pie memory is probably not a shock for those that know me well. Your first meat pie of the millions that you've had (sighs) in your lifetime since. Didn't we have a meat pie every day in South Africa? We probably (laughs) definitely did. Probably. (laughs) But yeah, I think that's, you know, my list, favorite ones I've been to. My list for wish, my wish list, my list for wish. Similar to yours, you know, Bombonera's on there, Camp New. San Siro. You know, over there in Milan, home to AC and Internazionale. 
rumors are that they're going to tear it down. They might try to save it. It might not be there for a while. So that's kind of like pressing on me. I want to get there sooner rather than later. And uh, I'll throw in this this last stadium. This is kind of a weird one, um, but it's it's popped up on the internet for me. And I just, I don't know, I'm super intrigued by it. Timsa, Timsa Park, but it's in Bursa, Turkey. Uh, it's home to Bursaspor. I think they're in like the second league of Turkish football. Anyway, their nickname, because of their green, I think green and white are their colors. They're the crocodiles. And the stadium, the exterior has been constructed to look like a crocodile. <laughs> And I just think I was hoping be, you were going to explain it because yeah. I feel like it, that would be a it, cool place to just, I don't know, see all the pictures I see are from like above, you know, helicopter shots and stuff. I don't know what, what the experience would be on the ground, seeing it face to face. Apparently the eyes of the crocodile light up at night, but again, <laughs> always wanted to, you know, still want to get the Turkey. So might as well throw some footy travel and some stadium experiences in there. That's, that's on my list too. Add it to the list. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know you were such a crocodile fan though. Oh, I love me some Crocs. <laughs> not the shoes speaking of stadiums our next question uh, is also on stadiums uh, my name is steve marzival i'm from new jersey and i would like to know like what was your favorite travel story to a stadium like getting to a stadium from where you were i don't know if this is much of a story uh, but the first thing that comes to mind for me is my local mls team the rapids their supporters group centennial 38 or c38 they run a really great uh, supporters bus or fan bus from downtown bars out to the Dick, as they call it, Dick's Sporting Goods Park. That's I where think, they play. Yeah, they play at the Dick. <laughs> they, I think for like 12 bucks round trip, you know, you get the ride there and back, but it comes with beer on the bus uh, to the game and back from the game. And then for another 10 bucks, you can do an all you can eat tailgate. So that's a, that's, that's probably a joyful chance. Yeah. Oh, and, tons, and, tons of and, chance. And, and, fun atmosphere some that are very disrespectful to their rival uh real salt lake which we won't mention on the pod right now but we'll we'll point you towards episode three i think where we talk to some rapids <laughs> fans on the footy travelers podcast check that one out uh but yeah not really a story i guess steve so to answer your question maybe more properly and, and mike help me fill in the blanks here but i want to say we were in south africa we were in or around Joburg or pretoria trying to maybe get out to soccer city we mm -hmm. got off of the the last part of the tr the transport out to the stadium because it wasn't like city central, and it's like this long walk, and it's a super big crowd, and the game's about to kick off, and I don't know. We saw these two police officers in their pickup truck off to the side, just kind of like directing traffic, the flow of pedestrian traffic, and someone said something to someone, and before you know it, we're in the back of the police pickup truck uh, and they're just giving us a ride to the front of this huge throng of people going to the stadium. And we like skipped having to walk probably a good, I don't know, half a mile, maybe even a mile to the stadium, thanks to their generosity. So not man, maybe not an incredible story, but just kind of a fun way to say that we have, uh, we've gotten to a stadium uh, at the World Cup, getting a ride from some police officers. No Via one else a did. police escort. Yeah, we've, we've had our own police escorts from day one. That was um, maybe one of the few times that we were beneficiaries of looking like damsels in distress in, in, <laughs> in very, very touristy, lost individuals. But like, so, like half the other people were too. I mean, right. I, I don't know why I they can't explain us why they the picked crowd. us. Yeah. Um, what about it you? It wasn't it definitely wasn't for the amount of money that we had in our pockets at the time. No, I don't. We didn't pay. Yeah. No, I remember we, this is one of my favorite stories. We didn't know if we should pay. Oh. And so you and I were speaking in Thai to each other, gotcha. wondering in front of that person, in front of the guy that's driving us being like, do we pay him? How much do we pay him? What should we do? Right. Did they ask? Um, that's it. This is where you can help me fill in my memory. Like they never asked no, us for money. I, no, they didn't. I think we gave them like a very, very small amount just being like, that was really nice of you. Thanks. Gotcha. Cool. Um, your favorite I have two, yeah, I have two, two stories. Story. One, both of them being fairly recent. The first being the Metro ride to Q2 Stadium in Austin, where Austin coming up again for you. Nice. I know. I know. It was a good time. My sarcasm and wit, <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> my clever, uh, my clever mind. Yielded uh, a pretty cool chance encounter with some fellow, fellow footy travelers. The story very briefly goes which I do believe we talk about in our episode in covering Austin. Oh, uh, yes. And so we were sitting on the train waiting for whatever its timetable departure date or time. And finally, we start to take off and we see this couple running towards the train as we start to slowly exit the station. 
and I had yelled out like, hey, wait, 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 someone's trying to catch on the train. So they did stop it and open the doors. And this couple comes in. They're like, oh, thanks so much. So I let them know as they sat down. Hey, you know, like I, I made the train stop for you and you've, you've got a couple beers in your bag. I think I probably deserve one of those beers, <laughs> given the fact that I got you on this train. And I said it jokingly. I sat I didn't even stand up. I just sort of mumbled it like 20 seconds later. He walks up to our seats and hands us a beer. Hey, thanks so much. Oh, wow. Did not anticipate that being a working and B. I felt guilty that. Yeah. What a dick, Mike. <laughs> I know. The beauty of it was it was a great conversation starter. Yeah. We walked with Edgar and Leia, who were the ones, the couple that we saved uh, from getting onto the Metro. And God, we had a really so good selfless. conversation. <laughs> and and uh, they walked us the hopscotch. <laughs> still, still calling it that, huh? Still calling it it. I'm never going to stop. It's uh, Hop Squad, but I just like to call it Hop Squad. Hop Squatch to Mike. Um, yeah, that's a good story. And They were cool. And, uh, and, and, and we drank with them for like, Another hour and a half, they gave us a bunch of details about, you know, the stadium and the the brewery. And I mean, I feel like they were just like nice local guides for us. So it was just a chance encounter. And then speaking of a chance encounter, this is a more recent one, which some of you may have already heard this story, but it's worth repeating. We took a ferry ride from Sydney Harbor to the Women's World Cup final, the 2023 Women's World Cup final, just a few months ago. And we were standing on the the front of the boat kind of outside, just taking it all in. And we were next to three journalists that had media badges on. And we were kind of like peeping, trying to see who they worked for. And Colin happened to recognize the face of one of them as he is a very popular senior sports writer for ESPN in Mark Ogden. Mark Ogden, yeah. And whom we've had on the we pod. We chatted with them. Yeah, who we just had on the pod uh, a few months ago. And we... Had a really good conversation with them. They they liked our capes. They liked our our gear in the in the, the setting itself of just going to a match via boat is pretty amazing. And we also talked about how that was maybe one of the most interesting transportation um, means that we've been able to get to a stadium from. So those would be my two. Pretty cool. Yeah. We kind of gave Rory Smith a hard time uh, pretending we didn't we did. uh, know who he was. Um, so we got to give Rory Smith a shout out. I already mentioned Ian Herbert uh, in the book I'm reading from him. So right. all, all three of those Sorry, guys. Rory. <laughs> you're, you're more than just an intern. <laughs> oh, he's definitely more than that now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those three guys were great to meet on that uh, on that trip to the stadium. Steve actually also gave us a second question. And I would like to know where Scarf started being worn in football, but not American football. So as far as I know, uh, I believe supporters' scarves started in the UK, in England, in the 1900s, sometime pretty early in that century. And I think it was just a, really a, a way for fans to show their support via the team colors, but still stay warm in the traditional attire that they were wearing. I mean, back then, you know, everyone's kind of wearing almost like your Sunday's best every day, you know, dark coats and, you know, tweed pants and button up shirts, what have you. So the first ones were pretty functional. You know, they were meant to be scarves and, and warm because it's chilly in England for most of the season. But again, kind of a, a way to show some of the, the support through representing the colors. And actually, according to Frank McDonald, who wrote in a Roughneck Scarves blog post, we have to mention Roughneck Scarves because they actually made the Footy Traveler scarves, which I'll mention later. Yeah. But uh, in this blog post, he says that one of the first sightings of a Footy I almost said footy traveler scarf of a, of a supporter <laughs> scarf was from this 1934 film clip from Arsenal's FA Cup fourth round tie versus Crystal Palace. So I don't know. I don't, I don't want to toot the, my, you know, my fellow Gunners fans horn too loudly, but Arsenal fans may have started the supporter scarf. Just saying. Is there another way to say that? Do you, you don't want to load load your weapons Lo- i don't want to uh, a little bit load the cannon too quickly or too proudly or yeah yeah toot my horn i don't know um just to add to this steve you know i think the originals you know tended to be very i want to call them bland but you know either single or or dual colored but they slowly have trended towards having team names on them crests slogans different things uh, I'd imagine that most of them were hand knit from that point in <laughs> at fact that time in fact they actually were yeah i think Grandmothers were mentioned as being some of the first producers of of knit scarves for teams and, and supporters. But you know now they're mass produced, and now it's popular to have scarves commemorating a match. 
Uh, Although, yeah, I will say two things that I've been told by what I would classify as fairly diehard English footy fans. Mm -hmm. First is it's very typical for Americans to really like jerseys because I had mentioned that and you see it more frequently. But I think in England, oftentimes, like you mentioned, the attire is like more practical and jerseys are not practical if it's very cold out. So you're going to be wearing jackets. And so there's no point in wearing a jersey because it's going to be too cold. So here's a scarf. Mm -hmm. The second point is match scarves specifically are they had said this to me. So pardon my language, but match scarves are for puffs, which puffs. Yeah. Like, um, like a P O O F puff. No, like a puff. Oh, but like, like a marshmallow. Yeah, maybe um, I'm trying to think of a more appropriate way to say this, but like you could maybe say a loser. Oh, um, well, pardon me. And no, I've got match scarves, too. I'm not I'm not English, so I don't care. But I had heard that match scarves show that you're maybe not as much of a true fan because you're like, why would I get a scarf with my Your rival or my uh, opponent on it? Whereas, OK, if I'm a diehard, I'm going to have my own scarf. And oftentimes it's like your own community within the team supporters. So like, yeah, you sit in this section or you're part of this neighborhood or you have, and they have their own scarves beforehand and they have their own scarves versus like a match scarf being like, uh, you just go to the big matches and you want to claim that you go to big matches. Yeah. But I mean, if, yeah, if you're a neutral then, and you don't have a scarf already, I don't know. I think it's, no, I think the arguments totally fly. I think they're being salty. Actually, speaking of match scarves, you might like this little stat, but in that same blog post I was mentioning, it quoted the Fanatics site, like the sports memorabilia website, Fanatics. Mm -hmm. The best-selling scarf that they had in 2021 was, in fact, not a team or a country's scarf. It was a match scarf. Mm -hmm. Do you know which which match it was, Mike? I can happily guess that it was the Champions League final, Chelsea versus City at Porto, which... If people didn't remember, Chelsea had won that match. It was. It was that match. Yeah. So I figured you liked that. Anyway. Yeah. You know, today we have match scarves. Sorry to the diehards and the ultras. (laughs) We also have uh, scarves for all seasons. You know, they're not just meant to keep you warm. They're just meant to show off your support. Summer scarves are a thing. In fact, the FTP scarf is a summer scarf. It's a lighter scarf. Uh, And maybe here is where I'll say, if you want to support your footy travel lifestyle, here comes the advertisement. Or maybe you want to hang, uh, you know, your footy lifestyle on a wall as a nostalgic reminder of more light-footed, jet-setting days. Head over to the Footy Travelers Fan Shop and pick up one of our supporter scarves. We have a really great supporter scarf designed by none other than your Mike Tyrone, co-host of the Footy Travelers That's podcast. Me. That's you. So uh, we'll leave a link in the show notes for you to get there. Uh, well, thank you to all of our listeners who sent in questions, however you sent them in. Uh, that was pretty fun. I actually, yeah, I think we should do more of this. kind of helps us to think too about where we've been and what we've done and what we've seen and really how we should go about uh, continuing to do what we do and traveling around the world for all these all these games and these experiences. I, uh, I have some questions for you, Mike. I have some questions for you. Oh, I want to ask you, what has been the most dangerous footy travel experience you've ever had? And I'm, you know, I'm defining Mm. footy travel as like both elements, like it could be directly footy related. It could be travel related, but I will say it has to be travel related or it can be travel related if that travel experience directly involved soccer. Yeah. I feel like the former, I haven't really had any very serious danger, dangerous experiences in a like so in stadium or in stadia really maybe getting into places or getting out of places felt a little bit dangerous because it's like overcrowded and you know large groups and you maybe can't control where you're moving very much but that's like the worst that it's been so knock on wood i'm glad that i haven't had yeah anything worse than that but the footy travel experience i'd say there's probably like three that kind of come to mind for me one being i got into a pretty bad car accident while in lesotho which was just after I arrived in South Africa slash Lesotho for the 2010 World Cup. I won't go into details about the accident, but uh, I put myself in maybe a more vulnerable position trying to get from one part of a country to another part of a country. And I paid the price for it, I guess. (laughs) Um, That was pretty dangerous. I mean, that was borderline end of days for me. Um, Like, and then genuinely, like genuinely. Yeah. Yeah. Like, a couple feet away from 
being flung into a canyon. Oh. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, the the highlight is sitting on the back of a pickup truck being flung from the tailgate of the pickup truck to the hood in the air and landing on another person and then coming to realize that that truck was only a few feet away from going into a very large ravine. Slash Yikes. Canyon. Yikes. Yeah. So, yeah, that was pretty dangerous. Honestly, the three that I came that I can think of are all ones that happened in Africa. Um, running from the police in central South Africa, unknowing that we were running from the police necessarily. But Wait, we uh, after, was I involved in that? You were not. Oh, okay. um, this was with my friends, uh, Matt and Eric, who I had met at the USA Algeria match. So like your, be- your best friends to... that you, you remember their name. <laughs> right, exactly. Who I, you know, met only 13 years ago and have really never seen them ever since. But Yeah, we were driving to Rustenburg or no, not Rustenburg. We were driving to I can't recall the name of the town middle of nowhere to see the knockout round that the US had qualified for. And we had someone trying to flag us down. They were like in all black in the middle of the road trying to wave us down. And we're like, "Mm, that's weird. We wonder if they're just like trying to sell something or whatever. It's like literally the middle of nowhere. And we'd seen like three people over maybe a three hour drive doing that and we finally stop for gas and then these two cops like pull up and park between our car parking for gas and they're like you all need to come to the police station you're being arrested and we're like what are you talking about and they're like we've been trying to stop your car for the last several you know kilometers or whatever oh boy and we're like that was just a random person they're like no 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 no, that was police and so we were like the deb- like you know debating it being like that you there was no sirens it was literally just a random person on the road and so they're like, you need to follow us to the police station. And so, wait, uh, can one I pause the, you? Were the, mm-hmm. the people that pulled up to you at the gas station, were they in police uniforms? They were. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So the people that were trying to wave us down were not. Okay. But the people in police uniform uh, at the gas station were in uniforms. I wrote down one of the officers like badge numbers because I'm like, I don't really know if I believe this. So while we were, while we are driving behind the two cars that are taking us to the local police station, one of uh, the guys in the group calls, uh, I don't know if it was his dad or a lawyer or someone that is somebody knowing of the law. <laughs> yeah, somebody. And was like, this is the situation. And the, the advice that they gave us was, how much longer are you guys going to be in the country for? And we all were like, we're leaving in under three days. And he was like, don't go to the police station, find a way to veer off track and get away from them. Do not give them any information, any further information and find a way to get away from them. And hopefully you'll be able to leave the country. What? <laughs> so that's what we did. We like had a fork in the road and, and I think it was Matt and he was just like, I'm going to do it guys. We're like, all right, do it. And he just like, <laughs> like broke from the caravan and we just like bolted and we all were able to fortunately get out of the country and our passports wow. didn't get, you know, flagged by by uh, customs. They didn't like they didn't follow you or no, we didn't. I don't know how they didn't follow us, but I feel like it was <laughs> it, Gee was, it was wild. It was like I have so I many mean, questions, but yeah, we're yeah, we're we're, we're getting deep into this. Um, OK, was, wow. Yeah. I'm glad you're here. It was it was, yeah. it was, it was a crazy experience. Glad you're not guess, in the South African jail. Yeah, same, 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 same. Okay. So. Um, and then you and I almost got run off the road in Joburg, which I felt like was quite an attempt to maybe get something from us. Yeah, that was kind of weird. That was a, a weird scary. situation. Yeah. So back to you. Well, oh, which okay. I have a feeling I know what yours is. I was going to say, not, but... not that you asked, but actually all this talk about South Africa makes me think of... Um... <laughs> We're not typecasting South Africa or Africa in general. No. It's just per chance, these are where our stories have I mean, come. we've been to a limited number of places in the world for footy travel, I guess, as much as we have been around the world for footy travel. But how many places we've been? A lot. Six inhabitable continents. Yeah. But like there's 190 some countries in the world, you know. Anyway, math <laughs> aside, your stories make me think of after, I guess it was after the tournament, I did some traveling still in South Africa. I went to Kruger National Park and I'll, yeah, I'll try to make my story pretty quick, but Basically, I was parked up at this watering hole, seeing like all sorts of animals come and, you know, monkeys and warthogs. And, you know, it was like a scene out of The Lion King. And all of a sudden, this big herd of elephants comes and all the other animals scurry away. And the elephants come and cool themselves off. They flip the water with their trunks onto their bodies and take a drink. And then they start marching on. And the last one to come through was the bull elephant of the group. 
herd or whatever you call a group of elephants. And um, I had this camera at the time. It was one of those point and click digital cameras. It wasn't really fancy or sophisticated, but the front of it was just super flat and, and chrome. And I like tilted it to push it up against the windshield. We're sitting in the car. We're not outside with the animals. And the way I tilted it, it reflected the sun into the elephant's eyes, I guess. And that like freaked the elephant out and it turned towards the car and it flared its ears out and it took two or three large stomps towards us. And it, like, it was about to charge. I was like, oh, you know, shit, it's like freeze. I was with my girlfriend at the time. And, like we both didn't move for a solid, like it felt like forever. It was probably like a good two minutes though. And it was this stare down. I was just waiting for this elephant to come and crush us and like stomp on this little, you know, dinky four cylinder rental car that we had. And someone's going to read about it in the paper one day that, oh yeah, two tourists killed in, in Kruger National Park for dis <laughs> disrupting the elephants. But yeah, I don't know. That was just, that was super scary in that moment, at least. So did you get out? Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It eventually just like, you know, stopped staring at us and, and carried on, but. Yeah, the heart was pounding. So you guys won the staring contest. We won the staring contest. <laughs> All right, how about one more question? We need to wrap this up, but top goals you've witnessed live. And when I say live, you witnessed them happening in the moment. So that could be in stadium, but it could also be on TV. Oh. Because, you know, we footy travel and sometimes we watch games like amongst locals and pubs and stuff and whatnot. And I want to give credit to that. Yeah. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go in live because I feel like the, I feel like I've seen a lot of really incredible goals in the comfort of my own home or even in another country. Okay. And yeah, yeah. I'm going to go, I'm just going to go live. Um, so like in stadium, you mean? Like in person? Yeah. Okay. Yep. One of them is kind of embarrassing, but it was my first international goal that I ever saw scored live. It was at old Foxborough stadium in new England. It was Mexico against USA in a World Cup qualifier for the 98 World Cup, 43 seconds into the match. Wow. A lot of famous names here. Uh, goalkeeper Casey Keller took a back pass from Lexi Lawless. Keller took like one touch and wanted to just punt it down the field. And the Mexican striker was charging and the punt did not go high enough. And the striker jumped up and it hit directly off of his head down onto the ground and then bounced over Keller's uh, head and scored a goal in the 43rd second of the match. When you, when you say punt, this wasn't like a punt out of his hands because it was a pass back. No, so he was, yeah, it was a pass back. He like took a, taken a one clearing touch. kick. Okay. A clearing kick, excuse me. Yes, it was a clearing kick. I just want to paint, paint you know, the, the, the proper picture for our audio right. listeners. It did not come from his hands. It came off of the ground, which was part of the reason that I think it even was even physically able to happen because he didn't get enough clearance mm -hmm. off of the ball. And so it was coming from a lower level of a trajectory, but it hits off of the striker's face essentially. And he hit it hard enough that it just like looped over his head. And that was, uh, that's, there's a, so there's, one of the top, top, of one of the in, top goals for, for excitement, maybe not as a USA fan, one of your favorite, right? It was, it was, it was maybe not top, maybe more like memorable. I was like, what did I just witness? Yeah. And it is kind of wild. It's, it's kind of a ridiculous goal to uh, seeing it live. But I would say the biggest and greatest goal and arguably the greatest sporting experience that I've ever had was the very famous goal of USA versus Algeria oh. in 2010 yes. at the World Cup in Pretoria, the famous lines of go, go USA. Ian Dark's call after Landon Donovan slots at home. Yeah. And Donovan has scored! Oh, can you believe this? Go, go, USA! It was incredible. It was one of the most amazing experiences to witness it live. And I use that as a brag to many people when talking U.S. Shh. soccer sure. and saying I was I was there live. Yeah. And it was pretty amazing. That was... And I hugged and kissed every security guard I could have got my hands on <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Uh, that was before cancel culture came or COVID or COVID. We were young. Yeah. No, that, honestly, that's probably my top one. I think yeah. that's the best goal I've ever witnessed live. Uh, definitely in stadium. You talked about hugging and kissing every, everyone you saw. I mean, yeah, just jumping up and like, I, 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 I probably cried. I think I cried. Definitely cried. Like, I think uh, I was moved to tears. It was amazing. Yeah. If you were there, you know, you know the feeling. <laughs> well, Shall we? Wrap? I have one question. Oh. If you if you if you think you can if you can think if we can spare it, yeah, let's go for it. Let's do it. All right, my question. We've this is our fiftieth episode. Oh, yeah. We've got three amazing 
excuse me, 50 amazing stories, people, all these amazing things that we've experienced in our 50 episodes. Yeah. But what is your favorite episode that we have produced so far? Oh, put me on the spot, dude. I can give you two, I guess, if you if you're having a trouble picking just one. Um, I mean, I guess to pick one or two favorites is is definitely I want to say up front is not to say that I don't enjoy all of them. Um, you know, we have some great guests on. Uh, we meet a lot of great people. Very, very parent type of answer. as we travel. You know, I can't pick my favorite. Well, child. you know, I feel like this is kind of my baby. You know, I love, I love, I yeah. love the footy travelers. I love it. <laughs> um, okay, well. Yeah, two come two come to mind pretty quickly. The episode, the Craig Willinger episode, the Craig Willinger Fund uh, that we did with Emily Agata jumps to mind. It was one of the earlier episodes. You had talked a lot about your connection with the Craig Willinger Fund uh, down there in Baltimore. You know, it sounded like a great cause, but not that you didn't do a great job of telling me about it. But like Emily came on as one of the chair people of the organization and like really gave us the co-founder. story yeah, and then the co-founder, right? The story of Craig and his experience and how the fund started. And I mean, it really, when we talk about, you know, the spirit and the, the ethos of the footy travelers and what we do, the Craig Willinger fund is a great example of that in another organization. So, you know, Hey, here we go. Plug it right now. Listeners, if you haven't heard, Oh, how good's my memory? I want to say it's like episode 13 or 15 or somewhere in there. But go go check out the Craig Willinger Fund episode with Emily Agata. And then uh, the other one that jumped to mind, we, you know, we'd mentioned his name already. What was the episode we did with Mark Ogden, that senior writer, senior football writer from ESPN that we met on the ferry to the Women's World Cup final? I mean, you know, as you can imagine, as someone who works in the space, I mean, he's got some travel stories. Uh, he's, he's, been, he's been tons of places, tons of amazing places. I mean, you know, San Marino. I think he was on his way there when we when we talked to him for a, I guess that would have been a Euro qualifier game. Uh, he's traveled with Man United as one of their reporters or one of the you know people who had access directly to the team in their heyday when Fergie was still the coach, Sir Alex Ferguson. I don't I I don't know anyone else who's been to Kazakhstan um, in general, <laughs> let alone for football. Uh, but he went there with Man United, I think for their like Europa League game or something. So. Yeah, that was just another great episode with tons of great stories. And um, Mark Mark brought them. He was a great guest, and that was a great episode. So what about you? I'm going to put you on the spot if you're going to put me on the spot like that. <laughs> I mean, both of those are very much so in the top list for me. But if for, for sake of being unique and having different answers, I would say, and this is maybe cheating, I really liked our Need to Know Qatar uh, World Cup series so several episodes, uh-huh. which is kind of cheating, a bit. but I liked it because one of the very first things and reasons that we decided to do this podcast was because we got a lot of questions from people who were interested in what we did and how we do it and how to prepare for a major tournament and getting tickets and getting there and where to go and how to decide where to go. And, and I feel like we did a lot of research for those episodes, but we also did a lot of really good tie-ins to our experience and though there are no guests in those episodes i guess maybe other than one we had some good research i guess in terms of fellow colleagues that we knew that were in qatar that gave us some good on the ground insights i just liked the extent of the research that we gave because i do think that and i hope that they helped people and if i was to pick one that had a guest i really love topo ramon yeah his story is one that i often tell people as like a classifying element of what it means to be a footy traveler kind of risking life and limb to attend a world cup and travel the length of an of a continent and do it on the the seat of a motorbike so i just think that episode is really fun and he's got a really cool um energy and I yeah. think that he epitomizes, you know, a, a proper footy traveler. Love it. Yeah, that's a good one, too. Shout out to Topo. Francisco. All right, footy travelers. This has been absolutely amazing. Uh, the fact that we're even here celebrating 50 episodes with you guys is, um, I don't know, it's a mix of emotions, I'll say. I might I might come to tears yet again. I'm looking forward to uh, <laughs> to the it. next 50. Yeah. I'm looking forward to, you know, ultimately hosting footy travelers here in our country come world cup 2026 i'm looking forward to some uh footy travels even sooner with euro 2020 what four Four. yeah next year's 2024 gosh is it already 2024 almost it's crazy 
Where have you been moving? It's been a long time since 2010. <laughs> anyway. We're uh, getting old. Collins, we got gray. Collins and, blabbering yeah. already. Uh, we're going to close this out. If you enjoyed the episode, check out our other episodes. Tell some friends about the show. If you really like the episode, if you really like the show, please rate us wherever you're listening. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, please give us a proper written review. We'll accept that as our 50th episode anniversary gift. That could be. A, from that's you. a great idea. You know, that would that would be really nice of you. We're in lieu of flowers and in presents. We would like uh, a rate and review and a subscribe if possible. But if you'd really love to spend the money, you know, check out the Footy Traveler fan store. Like we mentioned earlier, hey. we got some great products uh, up for sale there. Got some good supporter scarves. Still have a few, just a few though. Footy Travelers jerseys left. Our new kits also designed by uh, yours truly, Mike. <laughs> But when I say yours truly, I feel Did you like, forget my name. <laughs> no, I just debated whether or not saying yours truly was appropriate. It, it wasn't me. It was Mike. Mike designed the jerseys. I uh, did a great job. They're fly as hell. That's all I can say. And you know what? Even if we're not doing a 50th episode anytime soon, send us more questions. We'd love to have them uh, on the podcast and answer them for you. So that's one of our favorite parts of doing this. Until we hear from you guys, until you hear from us, be loud, be proud, and be good to each other. The Footy Travelers Podcast is a production of Fiper Media. To learn more about their other work, visit FiperMedia.com. That's F-Y-P-E-R Media.com. Our episodes are edited by me, Colin Martin. Mike Tyrone is our creative director. Cover art is by Felix Palau. Theme music comes from Shumatar, with additional music from Mr. Mastermind. Our incredible intro voice is Helen Mymaris. You can keep up with all things footy travel by following us on Instagram at footy travelers. We'll see you next time.